Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги. Я рад вас всех приветствовать. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I'm very uh, pleased to welcome you all to our roundtable discussion that is called Finance, Market and Culture. Uh, the fact that we're quite few in the audience testifies to the fact that uh, this roundtable discussion brought together only very progressive people because we're like in um, uh, IT uh, and high tech uh, because the culture uh, in the 21st century will prove to be uh, such a, a sphere and uh, these financial resources and uh, the legal issues related to that will increase uh, in number. Uh, and uh, it's, I think, uh, due to lack of understanding of and, uh, uh, just imagination and the good taste that people frequent roundtable discussions dedicated to oil and gas and rare ores and metals and so on. So I'll explain why. Uh, so uh, Christie's uh, representative is among the speakers and just uh, uh, the value of art increases. It's not only through prices, but also through the number of people who are involved in producing and uh, uh, buying uh, artworks. It's uh, no issue of this round table whether it's good or bad, but it's self-evident that the artistic ideas and uh, um, methods become the impact and the engine behind the revivals of uh, whole regions who turned out to be uh, depressive, uh, like Glasgow, because of the overall uh, destruction of the uh, economy. And Glasgow proves that through the development of creative industries, it was possible to bring back to life the whole uh, coal-based uh, region after the uh, mines were closed down and just the coal prices went down as well. So a new economy rises uh, related to the new sales system because when people come to trade centers today, they choose a new standard of life and just the trade centers that uh, originated as a a uh, place to buy a certain, to, to offer s a certain things, certain commodities to certain people became part of the entertainment industry. So the economy of experience uh, is uh, more important than, uh, an economy of happiness is more important than economy of commodity. So if you take a, a cup of coffee in McDonald's, uh, it costs a dollar, uh, whereas in Piazza Navona in Rome, it's 10, or in some other places, it's 15. It's because you are surrounded by uh, culture, and you are much happier to pay a higher price because uh, you are in a much more cultural environment than you are when in McDonald's. Today, uh, the situation has changed in uh, the, that segment of culture that is funded, has been traditionally funded and uh, covered by the state budget. And I hope that the uh, speakers in uh, this roundtable discussion will tell about their experience and give more details about uh, how they uh, uh, suggest developing the traditional uh, cultural sphere and uh, some other related new developments and uh, the issues that uh, it uh, brings about in the legal environment. And using uh, artworks in the internet and internet project products uh, in general, uh, from uh, search engines uh, to YouTube, uh, also uh, invokes a lot of legal discussion today, because uh, related uh, rights uh, as regarding regarding the internet and the copyright uh, in the internet have not been fully resolved. There is a great debate ongoing. Uh, but uh, some uh, uh, there is a lot of disagreements. The modern authors uh, tend to have one stance, whereas the libraries have to disagree. Uh, 
with their position. It all calls for more discussion and understanding. Before we invested uh, monies into culture, and now uh, just uh, we see monies in the culture, and those who don't understand it frequent other roundtable round table discussions. So I would like to uh, give the floor now to Mr. Tsitkov, who is a legal uh, uh, person, the only one. Uh, so please, the floor is yours. I'll try not to abuse your attention and uh, not overload you with uh, legal information on the problem, presenting only a brief analysis of uh, uh, fund fundraising or non-budgetary uh, funding because actually this is the main source for culture, funding source for culture. Outlining the main mechanisms or tools for uh, this fundraising source, uh, we can mention six sponsors, uh, then all kind of charity de donations, grants, endowment funds, organizational interaction of uh, non-for-profit organizations, and also lotteries. So if uh, I were to outline the legal problems uh, or challenging associated with the aforementioned mechanisms for non-budgetary funding of culture, there are three of them. Number one is taxation. Taxation makes it very often not beneficiary for uh, cultural institutes to seek uh, for funding from non-budgetary funds. And it is not uh, been, uh, good for uh, the donators either. The second problem is that of getting the funds providing, provided and also control over the use thereof. And the third problem that we face is um, uh, relatively obvious. It's the problem of uh, spending the funds received by cultural institutes. In practice, we see that many cultural institutes simply refuse from getting funding from non-government sources, realizing that it would be uh, more than difficult to spend them efficiently. So considering the problems or challenges, um, uh, if I categorize them, uh, firstly, sponsorship. Uh, sponsorship um, is mentioned in the law on advertising, even though the clear definition is absent there. But nevertheless, we can conclude that sponsorship is providing funds uh, for organizing cultural events or creating or using the results of creative activity. Uh, should the funds be provided on the uh, terms of uh, 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 that uh, they should mention uh, the sponsor, then we deal with uh, sponsorship advertising, but not sponsorship as charity activity. So Russian legislation contains articles that raise huge problems both for donators and for the recipients of those donations who, well, uh, information about the sponsors of the event is desirable for sponsors, of course, but it raises a big issue. Any uh, rendering of money uh, of this kind is now uh, qualified as sponsorship advertising with all the issuing consequences for taxation. Mm, what other legal challenges uh, there are? The core um, problems for this type of uh, funding for uh, government uh, cultural institutes. So sponsors' money comes into the budget of the organization and then becomes personal. So hence it is impossible for the organization to dispose of sponsors' money because the uh, 
just uh, certain limits are set uh, by the higher standing budget. And then uh, just uh, the, the organization is mandated to um, spend this money following the procedure stipulated by the federal law on purchasing uh, goods for it's law number 94. Uh, as of next year, this uh, will be regulated by law 44, um, contract law. For uh, uh, non-government organization. The main, the main problem for spending sponsors' money is that uh, it is stipulated by the law on uh, purchasing and using uh, the uh, goods stipulated by the aforementioned law, which is general law. And uh, autonomous cultural institutes, they spend uh, sponsors' money accord in accordance with the law, uh, with Article 223. So that uh, raises less problems. The main problems related with taxation is that Mm. Tax services can accuse uh, the organization in uh, uh, economic. Uh, they say that this is uh, uh, entrepreneurial activity, so this is not justified by your mission. And uh, sometimes similar accusations are put forward to the recipients when the tax authorities say, "So you know, you sp you're spending this money um, without any." Uh, rationale. So you are not entitled to uh, using it this way. Uh, so the serious uh, risk is uh, uh, present here, and of course, this claims about the methodology of uh, money allocation between uh, entrepreneurial and the core activity of the Cultural Institute. Uh, the next uh, type, it's uh, charity donations. So this is regulated by the federal law on uh, uh, charity organizations. And uh, unlike sponsorship, here we deal with uh, uh, just charity donations. This is... Uh, This is about uh, some uh, unselfish or uh, that this is about the situations when there is no economic interest in uh, rendering services or giving money for certain issues. Hence, one more problem. Uh, would, when tax uh, authorities, they recategorize this uh, or that type of donations, and uh, they refuse to see it as a charity donation, and they uh, kind of categorize it as sponsorship, and uh, with all the tax consequences. Uh, so the types of the charitable donations, uh, direct donations from physical persons and legal entities, then these are donations from charity foundations. Number three, it's uh, donations uh, in the uh, format of endowment, and uh, then donations of specialized organizations that manage uh, the uh, capital uh, just uh, representing the Ministry of Culture. As uh, for the, according to the general rule, charity donations are uh, not uh, VAT uh, taxable, but in practice we have a lot of examples when tax authorities, they recategorize uh, charity donations into uh, sponsorship. And uh, that means a huge uh, tax production. So other problems. So the risk of this recategorization into sponsorship advertising uh, that I have already mentioned, which then is uh, included to the taxable basis, then the tax uh, authorities can refuse to make it VAT free. Uh, uh, then uh, the risk of claims uh, for some documentary proofs uh, 
and uh, we have uh, lots of examples from court practice. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, just uh, charity donations um, uh, should also, the spending this money should also follow the same rules uh, stipulated by the federal uh, laws as are envisaged for sponsorship funding. As you know, on the 24th of April, uh, we had the, a new law adopted, a law on uh, philanthropy, and it contains uh, some new positions. For example, uh, uh, philanthropy is considered uh, as a type of cultural activity, then uh, uh, philanthropists uh, can be physical uh, entities and legal persons that uh, are just uh, giving over their property, including um, money, um, without pursuing their uh, interest. But we believe that this is only a draft law. Well, it will be changed later, because it's now adopted only in the first reading. And uh, there are a lot of items that will be uh, rather a hindrance than help for charity activities. Uh, for example, mm, uh, this notary certification of every agreement in uh, philanthropic support and so on and so forth. Uh, so most likely this draft law will be revised and improved and uh, many experts now claim that philanthropy is a type of charity activity, and so all the approaches exercised towards the charity activity should be exercised towards uh, philanthropy. Next type is grants. Russian legislation does not contain any general definition of what grant is, and this also entails uh, large problems. Uh, for example, in the law, Or in the tax code and in some other normative acts, um, different definitions are uh, offered, but uh, overall we can say that grants are monetary and uh, other types of donations that are given uh, revocably uh, by the physical persons and legal entities and uh, also international organizations that have the right uh, on uh, uh, granting money on the territory of the Russian Federation in accordance with the uh, order stipulated by the government of the Russian Federation. But this form as of funding grant can be used uh, both in sponsorship and in uh, charitable donations, which is what is important here is uh, just the entity given money should uh, clearly stipulate uh, the conditions or uh, the goals for which this money can be spent. So what are the problems here? They are the same as for sponsorship and charitable donations, with the only difference that uh, here we should note that in the new law number 44 uh, on contract uh, purchasing of uh, goods and services, Article 15 says that, among other things, that um, uh, government in, uh, cultural institutions will have the right of uh, making purchases on grant money and in accordance with the uh, items of uh, law 223, not 44, but 223. That means that they will be free to choose uh, their method of purchasing. At the same time, law 44 um, mandates uh, cultural institutions to approve and publicize uh, their kind of principles for purchasing. Uh, if uh, those cultural institutes that do that uh, will be able to uh, follow not Law 44, but Law 223 as of the 1st of January next year, which will open up room for more maneuver. Uh, so uh, the so I'm not going to speak about endowment in detail because it will be subject of uh, uh, another presentation. But as practice shows, uh, the most important issue uh, that uh, 
uh, faces uh, people who wanted to do some charitable giving is the lack of uh, 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 legal guarantees of, of uh, just uh, preservation of uh, monetary means that were channel would be channeled uh, through the endowment to the managing company because in a, instead of an income you can get a loss uh, if the managing company misperforms uh, this is uh, what hinders and uh, just uh, hampers the development of the endowment strategy in Russia in, uh, and uh, it requires for a clear and more efficient legislation to be developed another uh, method used by some cultural organizations um, uh, like in the Kremlin, Moscow Kremlin, and uh, many others, it's organizational um, interaction. When a cultural organization uh, enters into uh, a cooperation or interaction with uh, foundations or NGOs in a way that the cultural organization does not get any monetary giving, uh, monetary resources as giving, uh, they uh, join their efforts to run joint projects or join exhibitions or uh, events uh, with the charitable funds and uh, they enter into organizational agreement in such a situation when a cultural organization and a charitable fund uh, carry out uh, 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 in, uh, the activities independently and pay taxes independently. This is quite a, uh, an efficient form of interaction that helps to overcome many of the barriers and uh, issues I listed above. And uh, one thing you have to ensure is that you trace the content of such agreements because the Russian legislation has no standard model for such organizational agreements and should there be any uh, slips made in the wording of the agreement, uh, it uh, runs a great risk of being requalified into some other types of agreement and it will entail different, other, different uh, tax consequences. And just lottery is also one of uh, available methods and it's going to be covered in a different pres in a still different presentation, so thank you for attention. Thank you very much. I think we'll hear all the presentations and uh, we'll uh, 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 have all the questions and answers afterwards. I, I hope that we're not going to have the Haydn Symphony case when all the uh, presenters will take their leave one after another gradually. Uh, so uh, with a uh, situation with extra budgetary funding is quite challenging uh, in Russia. It is um, considered quite suspicious. Uh, some people think it's a kind of a laundry tool. Uh, Mr. Shatalo, deputy finance minister, thinks so in particular, who in any amendment of the tax legislation sees as an opportunity for the monies to leave the budget and be directed somewhere where it would never be found. Uh, so there are some different marked uh, taxes, opportunities which our uh, legal uh, environment does not use to support culture. The French cinematography um, uh, just used a special dedicated tax uh, that will be uh, 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 created to support uh, cinematography. Uh, this new uh, art patronship uh, law that was just covered by Mr. Tsvitkov was imperfect right from the outset. There were some amendments made because I think it should also encompass not only the cultural sphere but the, the uh, um, charitable sphere in general. I think it should relate to social and health care and uh, other spheres, uh, which should not be restricted to cultural sphere only. And uh, it's a protectionist one, definitely, because in one of the uh, versions of it, uh, it was stated that uh, patronship, art patronship, and its law only covers state and municipal uh, cultural organizations, which is absolutely anti-constitutional. Uh, because all the legal uh, entities that work in cultural sphere, irrespective of the type of ownership and structure and organization, uh, have a right to any uh, sponsorship uh, and charitable giving schemes. 
uh, one more thing has to be um, uh, borne in mind. Uh, Russian legislation is uh, still evolving and uh, changing, and uh, it depends a lot on the cultural, on the people of culture, cultural workers, to make it serve the needs of the culture and all the charit, all the recipients of charitable giving. So I think that Mr. Petrovsky has a colossal uh, experience in this regard. He was the first to introduce the uh, uh, Board of Trustees for the, uh, the Hermitage Museum, and he works with a lot of extra budgetary sources of funding. Yeah. The floor is yours. Uh, I wanted to talk about the uh, psychology and philosophy after such a brilliant analysis we just uh, heard. And I want to focus on a, a dialectic country, um, uh, kind of uh, uh, equilibrium, because tax bodies are our enemies, uh, like you know, our adversaries, like in a football field, because they think that the most important thing is to collect revenue and there are no dedicated or marked especially earmarked tasks, uh, taxes for culture, and just they, uh, just we need to bear in mind that today's uh, meeting and other sessions uh, need to work out ways to uh, act uh, to bypass the existing legislation and work in the current legislative situation. Of course, when somebody wants to give monies for culture, there are ways to accept it. Uh, beginning this year, uh, there were some privileges uh, provided uh, to reduce the taxable uh, base, uh, but people did not explain to us whether it works or not and how, uh, because people are afraid to, to, to give uh, money because nobody knows how exactly it's going to work. But after a year's pause, I think there'll be more volunteers. And um, there is a psychological kind of mental mindset. We uh, usually say the rest of the world has it, and we don't. The rest of the world doesn't have it uh, because it's only in the United States that there are uh, privileges and breaks for charity. There are no such things in the UK. In Germany, uh, there were some uh, privileges. Uh, so we are among all others who are in the same boat. And just the attitude to charitable giving and art patronship is important. We are very proud in St. Petersburg that we celebrate uh, the day of art patronship. Uh, so nobody knows whose exactly birthday it is. So just uh, we, I will bring Tiepolo's art patron painting to the Hermitage Center, uh, Theater to uh, uh, thank all those in the city who give uh, resources for the needs of culture, not only money, but other in-kind support. Art patronship and, and uh, philanthropy is not uh, what we are used to uh, uh, mean um, uh, historically, Shukin and Morozov are not patrons per se. They were um, uh, traders and they traded in fabrics. And uh, these people are the best uh, uh, connoisseurs of futures prices because um, uh, they, they needed to know when and how uh, to sell their fabrics. But they were very uh, well connected in the world of art, and they knew where to invest in order to bring uh, uh, income in uh, a couple of years' time. But philanthropy and art patronship is not entertainment and not a, uh, an attempt to uh, just uh, to pay something to the society, but it's uh, an investment into the future creators, into the future development. And, and uh, there was a uh, Zoltan Axis uh, book that was issued who thinks that all innovations in medicine and technology are not happening in uh, firm, uh, firms and institutions, but at universities who live on charitable giving and endowment funds, but not through the budget that is allocated through the development of production. I think this is a, a, a very distinct feature of current situation. Uh, innovations are born where charitable money is going, uh, uh, irrespective of the purpose of charitable giving. It's a charity that uh, breeds innovation. 
And this has to be uh, explained to people, because for culture, philanthropy is not only money. Uh, uh, because cultural institutions have to be autonomous, independent. It shouldn't be dependent on other people's money if it has only one budget fund for bu funding a source is bad. Museum has to be able to earn its own money uh, within the uh, 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 available uh, framework and just the charitable uh, money and the state funding. If all these sources are put together, we can do quite well. Speaking about the attitude of philanthropists and art patrons in our uh, country, we need to overcome this uh, common uh, mindset. Uh, uh, so we don't like uh, rich people and we despise very rich people, such a, there is such a saying. Uh, if people have a lot of money, it used to be good and now it, it is perceived as bad. But uh, this is these are all kind of psychological um, uh, attitudes uh, that are uh, that hinder the development of philanthropy. We can uh, multiply comparisons between uh, Russia and uh, the rest of the world. In uh, Russia, people give a lot of money uh, for uh, development of art, uh, and uh, people uh, in Russia think, why it sounds suspicious? Why uh, did he uh, do that? We distrust people, and everyone distrusts us. Uh, we can trust only one person, the president of the country, and this is the uh, all other people are not trustworthy. So this is the culture uh, of distrust. And acting in this culture, we need to find ways to extract benefit from charitable giving, because it's not only a benefit for him, but for us as well. So this is the uh, goal for the cultural organizations, because they want this charitable money for various reasons. Another important thing is endowment opportunity, because a philosophically important thing it's one of the greatest achievements of our legal system so that the cultural institutions can set up endowment funds. This is challenging. It's not easy. We started this process in the Hermitage. Something works out, something doesn't. But um, I think that endowment should become some a unique thing. It uh, should become a basis for the state funding because the budgetary funding and state funding with all this uh, lines and provisions with the cutbacks and uh, a lot of hustle and bustle and shuffling uh, when we uh, waste our time and uh, use our time inefficiently uh, chasing these monies. Uh, but when you have endowment, you have trust. Uh, here's the money. If uh, something did not work out after a year, mm, uh, then there should be checks on the results. Uh, if you did well, that's okay. Okay, if you didn't do uh, well, uh, you are fired. Uh, so the Hermitage example shows that income can be obtained. It's not a big one, but it's uh, important, and we discuss it at our councils and meetings. So it's much easier than um, uh, just uh, grab uh, state money from the state. And uh, lastly, uh, also a psychological thing, uh, uh, this copyright. So it's uh, copyright versus uh, brands and uh, collections. Uh, in the Hermitage, uh, we have a dual situation. So you cannot have, uh, you cannot uh, use the images of uh, this building and others without uh, copyright. However, this is um, uh, her this is part of the cultural and historical heritage. You cannot forbid to. Uh, uh, just uh, this. Uh, of course, if you have to charge money for Matisse's and Picasso's uh, pictures um, and painting, if you want a reprint, so uh, we do not like it. Uh, and uh, Gauguin will be the most popular uh, artist now because he has uh, no uh, heirs apparent and just who will uh, claim copyright uh, deductions. Uh, and we need to somehow strike a, a cultural balance inside ourselves because people do not 
uh, create themselves. So they just uh, materialize what God uh, uh, tells them to and uh, just uh, because the uh, culture belongs to, as culture belongs to the humankind so the, all the big artworks belong to mankind as well when you said uh, people do not like rich people in uh, Russia and uh, who likes uh, poor people by the way I just thought about it so one of the m most serious problems uh, is uh, what is it all for when we speak about the finance and culture and legal environment uh, we face a major question what for and uh, mr piotrovsky mentioned a very important thing inter uh, independence of cultural institutions of people who create uh, uh, science culture and literature but let us be realistic I do not remember the current budget of the Hermitage. I can quote from the Bolshoi Theater's budget because I know it's better. It's over 120 million US dollars, and these are monies that provided by the state. So the share of sponsorship and charitable giving, and as the Board of Trustees at best, accounts for 10 to 12, 15 percent at max. So speaking of endowments, uh, we should understand that in the United States, these are just uh, dozens of billions of dollars. Here, when we are just at the very beginning of this way, we can uh, not run away, so to speak, from the state. Uh, even if uh, it's a couple of millions worth uh, endowment, it will only bring about 10 percent if it's managed well, if you do not run the highest risks in investing its money. So it's a combination between the endowment money, uh, state money, and charitable giving for uh, that is uh, uh, applicable to the Russian situation. Uh, the state uh, uh, gives out a lot, and uh, I spoke with Glenn Laurie, with MoMA uh, director, and I told him, let me call one ad administrative institution in the United States, and I'll help you pull the right strings. He says, no, 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 my uh, board of trustees doesn't want to do anything, have anything in common with the state. It will be uh, viol violating our... Uh, uh, corporate ethics and in Russia even if uh, we need to do some to get some obtain some extra uh, budgetary money or just uh, resolve important things you need in, need to uh, enter into rela into a negotiation with the state uh, you see Gazprom label uh, here and I think it's time to turn the floor over to Menesitina uh, is uh, evident why cultural uh, institutions want to get uh, charitable uh, money. And the question is why uh, philanthropists want to give, uh, even probably for a better and bigger pleasure than uh, the recipients. Yes, so that was that was with great pleasure. Um, I'm going to think out loud on this topic, but if I may, let us give the floor over to uh, the person from the bank, Yulia Pantelev, and she'll continue thinking about Andam. You see, noble people, they want to share not only money, but also the floor. Uh, 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 I was very happy to hear from the Hermitage after a year uh, has elapsed uh, about the uh, idea of setting up endowment fund and its implementation uh, did not disappoint them, but uh, gave an impact for further development. Seven years ago, there was a law and endowment uh, adopted. Uh, some people uh, thought that we, this f endowment funds will mushroom in 12 months' time and will be uh, hundreds and thousands of them in Russia, but uh, in practice it proved to be a different case. 
So today uh, there are uh, a little bit over than 90 endowment funds uh, in Russia, a little bit uh, less than 50 percent has uh, some monies. Major funds are far and few between, uh, but the process has started and it's going on. So I'm not going to speak about the endowment mechanism as such. Uh, so it's one of the segments of charitable giving that is distinct from traditional additional charity in that the monies are not spent uh, on the implementation of projects when you receive the funds, but they are, so to speak, reserved and invested professionally, and only the um, investment income is channeled uh, for the needs of the cultural institutions. Uh, so there was a big uh, uh, gap in this segment back in 1990s and 2000s, so uh, it, it was uh, a shocking uh, thing at then uh, for NGOs, uh, so those who were doing fundraising in NGOs and uh, similar uh, settings understood it was not an easy scenario, but then after seven years, uh, we understand that if we want to ensure in an integrated civil society and uh, uh, just a mentality uh, that will in ensure the future, not only money is for today, we need to go to proceed along the lines of establishing endowments uh, for the needs of the cultural institutions and development of culture. As to the comp uh, comparative statistic, uh, when we say endowment, uh, we think of the major endowment funds, especially in the United States and university endowments like in Harvard, it's about 32 billion uh, uh, US dollars, but uh, apart from university endowments, and we always uh, often forget about it, there are major endowments for museums like Metropolitan Museum, 2.9 billion, uh, 2.7 just billion dollars. Uh, we did not reinvent the wheel in Russia and followed the, the same model. Uh, and the universities paved the way for endowment process. Uh, so last year, to our great uh, pleasure and uh, pride, uh, we saw the first museum, the Hermitage, that set up the endowment framework. So um, uh, I uh, support uh, uh, endowments, uh, and as we have to uh, provide management uh, uh, services for 21 endowments uh, in uh, over 20 something markets in Russia, there are success stories uh, f uh, about such a, an ambitious and global project for Russia, and there are uh, some skeptics who want to f follow. Uh, but uh, are not yet bold enough. So the skepticism was due to the fact that the major capital uh, collected in the w in the West, uh, uh, people forgot that uh, just uh, big capital in the West was formed back in 90 back in. 17th century, and it took a long time for it to augment. So 70 years uh, are not enough for that in Russia, so I hope we'll speed up. However, uh, it's a long way to go. So what it is that we need to overcome in order to accelerate the process when we deal with universities or museums, uh, we hear uh, about problems uh, and uh, uh, like uh, uh, a kind of a, a reserved capital when there are many um, uh, maintenance issues uh, that call for resolution and as the leaders are quite skeptical about setting up money uh, for further needs when some urgent and topical ones are at hand now. So it is important to overcome the mental attitude of the human factor, I think, is instrumental in the process. It is very difficult to believe in this uh, scheme 
uh, for those who uh, lead uh, the institutions to understand that it is a, a feasible option. So uh, Russia is uh, rated uh, as 138th, so bas basically in the endowment process and, and fundraising. 6% uh, of the population in Russia are involved in charitable giving, and about 20% uh, are volunteers. Uh, so 6% is a very little basis uh, uh, that uh, we can rely on. Just there are n uh, no, not enough oligarchs uh, to cover all the needs. So. Uh, so new donors uh, are not very uh, fast to emerge, and uh, I have a lot of pity uh, to, to those uh, uh, people who basically are approached because there are a limited circle of donors that everyone approaches. And I think we all need to overcome our own personal skepticism and uh, understand the situation better, uh, to remember where we studied, what cultural institutions we go to, what museums we visit, and give some feedback to the organizations that uh, uh, seek our uh, uh, money and to show how uh, because the uh, endowment is a measure of the quality of the service or uh, an experience uh, that we uh, get. Uh, when we once went to the Zartarske uh, Silo, we heard that one of the rich people after a tour that was personally organized for him donated uh, 100 million rubles for that in, in, as, a, as a gesture of gratitude. So he uh, appreciated the quality of his experience in the museum and uh, gave a lot of money. I think fundraising uh, also is an important uh, uh, trend that uh, museums need to learn because this is a fundraiser is increasingly becoming an important profession because people who want to attract money need to know the psychology how to uh, ask for uh, uh, how to elicit a donation in order to obtain it and uh, uh, how to ensure that the person who donated uh, is happy and not sad because he uh, lost so much money. Uh, uh, some uh, members of this profession are very successful, like clubs of friends and uh, a trust board of trustees and, um, and the leaders of cultural institutions uh, is, is a group that should work in concert to um, attract uh, extra budgetary funding. Uh, so I prepared a presentation uh, which speaks about the endowment in great detail. So I, I looked through the Metropolitan Museum's annual report and uh, just the grants and givings uh, brought by 20, account for 26 um, percent of the overall uh, income of the museum and the endowment income accounts to 33 percent. Uh, traditionally up to 40 percent uh, uh, can uh, uh, American museum, uh, museums and cultural institutions uh, receive up to 40% of their budget uh, given by the state. Uh, and another 40 uh, come from givings, charitable givings and uh, donations, even ex not excluding, including in endowments. Uh, uh, restaurants and tickets uh, account for much uh, lower percentage, so I hence I would like to uh, uh, call uh, all the institutions that can in, uh, do some charitable giving, uh, please uh, perceive it as, uh, uh, as, as our duty, because I think it should become part, part of our mentality. I want everyone in Russia to understand when you are approached uh, for uh, 
just uh, for, for the nation, it's uh, normal, it's okay. So this is a, a normal state of things in the society. Uh, we'll put off question and answer periods till a later time when we hear all the presentations. I would focus on two important things in Mrs. Pantileva's presentation. The mere uh, opportunity of setting out endowment fund and uh, just extra budgetary uh, it's an, a very important instrument of a civil society. Uh, uh, this is the atmosphere in the society that allows the cultural institution to pursue an independent policy, which is of utmost importance. Another important, the other important moment uh, is uh, that, uh, yes, the uh, circle of uh, institutions that uh, wish to uh, do some charitable giving uh, is quite limited. Uh, and uh, the cultural institutions like the Hermitage uh, or Mariinsky Theatre, the major international uh, entities, uh, for them to raise money either for endowment or through fundraising campaigns is much easier than uh, for a little uh, small museum in a little settlement somewhere. So uh, it is very important to create uh, an atmosphere uh, in the society when people understand that the next door laundry or bakery uh, in a little settlement in Russia, also should donate for its local library or its local museum if they want to live in a cultural environment. I think it was a very important comment made. Another important theme that we'll touch upon in today's discussion is uh, uh, is lotteries. Uh, so the finance ministry rejected the cultural ministry uh, they did not allow uh, the cultural lottery. Uh, it was a telling example. No matter how hard we tried uh, to promote it, the Ministry of Finance uh, uh, thinks it is not expedient. And they think uh, we'll do it our traditional way. We'll get the revenues and we'll redistribute them. Uh, so it was uh, quite contrary to what Mrs. Pantilei was dreaming about, unfortunately. The, uh, Mr. Karovin, the floor is yours. And um, uh, cultural income in Berlin, in Germany, and in Italy are basically formed. Uh, Thank you very much for the opportunity to address this audience. At first I thought that there are few people here because the word lottery was mentioned in the agenda, because lottery has negative implication in this country. But next year I will have 20 years of working within this industry. And I will try to at least convince you or maybe just uh, make you doubt about the negativeness of this aspect. And uh, I'll try to prove that lotteries can be positive. Unfortunately, I have no remote control to operate my PowerPoint. There is, we don't have, we have, we don't have your presentation. Is that true? Okay. Then I'll try. Well, I have several images. The rest is uh, text, but I will try to show you those images from the distance. The very first one is recognizable. It's Sydney Opera House. Sydney Opera. Mm, well, you know this institution, but few of you know that what it gives uh, its province. It's 100, 677 performances within one year, the audience of 1 million 
uh, persons, 8 million spectators of Sydney Opera, and few people know that it was the building was constructed and the money raised through the lottery. It was uh, conducted in Australia, Lower in South, South, Southern Wales, but uh, money was raised through the lottery. The next image maybe is less recognizable. This is Finnish National Opera. Mm, oh, why have I chosen two opera houses as examples? Because just uh, the forum was conducted in Marinsky Theatre. Finnish National Opera was built and is now maintained on the money raised through the lottery in Finland. It's 557 persons, 110 per musicians in the orchestra. The rest are the, rest are the choir and soloists, uh, performers, and it's about 1,100 invited or visiting performers within last year. You can't see it from the distance, but this is a kind of a advertisement of the, uh, the King Speaks. Uh, it's a good British film that um, won four Oscars, but again, this film was shot on the money uh, partially raised through the National Lottery in Great Britain. And uh, overall, the films uh, made uh, due to the National Lottery in uh, Britain won 14 Oscar awards. And the very last image I wanted to show you, it's uh, the painting by Vincent van Gogh, which is entitled The State Lottery. Even the great ones uh just were concerned about this theme and they left their footprint for the generations to come so what i'm trying to say here is uh well the images that i uh, wanted to show you they confirm the idea that culture and lottery are quite compatible. I don't want to overload you with figures and abuse you with some heavy, hard information, but uh, starting with 1994 in Great Britain, uh, 29 billion pounds sterling have been raised through the lottery, and major parts uh, were then given to as grants to culture, 6 billion worth of grants. In Finland, in 2011, the lottery uh, earned uh, several million euros, and uh, 20, over 20 millions were uh, allocated to culture. Uh, a little bit about the sad things. The lottery that would support culture only is non-existent in the world. Mm, beneficiaries. The main beneficiaries are sports and education, uh, just typical for the USA uh, and Europe, where sports is the main beneficiary from the lottery. And uh, especially sad it is that in Russia, the lottery industry is largely underdeveloped, uh, and uh, it gives, doesn't give any considerable uh, funding neither for sports nor for culture. Uh, lottery industry is regulated by federal law number 138, uh, it adopted in 2003. Uh, regulatory basis uh, for the lottery is stable, relatively stable which is uh, highly positive for the lottery industry because the uh, lottery industry is highly conservative as it is. Uh, so uh, there is some lagging behind. Well, I mean uh, the electronic media or the internet um, uh, lagging behind are not considerable. So we can claim that the basis for a developing lottery industry is in existence in Russia. but. Here we have an important uh, concern. Uh, it's the issue of the lottery and its beneficiaries. In the countries I've mentioned above, 
uh, the lottery is the, the lottery itself and its beneficiary. They are not directly related with one another. Uh, in all those countries, the lottery earns money, but then this money is allocated uh, through grants, and uh, this allocation is executed by independent from the lottery entities. Uh, for example, in the in UK, there is a special lottery fund, and the lottery itself is not related uh, with this fund in any way. Mm, but anyhow, uh, mm, uh, cultural entities uh, that are sponsored on the lottery money are numerous. In Finland, it is the government, that is the Ministry of Culture, that uh, deals with that. In the Russian Federation, unfortunately, the National Lottery just gives money over to the state budget, and uh, there this money is dissolved, if not lost. Uh, well, theoretically, this money can be extracted from the budget, but mm, there is no direct relation. Uh, direct relation exists only uh, if we're talking about private lotteries. In case of private lotteries, that are numerous, maybe too numerous in the Russian Federation, this direct relation does exist, but mm, uh, since they're too small, it would be wouldn't be reasonable to consider them as uh, any significant uh, revenue source. So, in my view, this clear, um, well, drawing clear borderline between the uh, object of the beneficiary and the lottery is important because people they don't like mentioning their winnings. They prefer remaining anonymous. And so for us to develop the industry, well, we would like to, and uh, actually uh, we have a commercial interest in advertising where it is that our lottery money goes uh, for. But currently we are deprived of this possibility. And uh, mm, so I have just uh, briefly outlined the current status quo of the industry, uh, maybe mentioned uh, some uh, hot points, and then I'm giving the floor over to other speakers. Thank you very much. I can say only one thing. This is one more piece of evidence to what uh, Madame Panteleva was talking about and to what uh, Mr. Tsvetkov uh, said, the society is not ready, meaning that social and psychologically we are not yet ready to use non-government tools that uh, may be useful for uh, the cultural institute's survival. But since the public uh, mentality is not ready for that, uh, are they uh, uh, there's uh, no worth even mentioning the mentality of bureaucrats and uh, the legal basis. Uh, culture is not only the recipient. Culture is a serious industry, and it's a serious financial market. And so it is with my greatest pleasure that I'm giving the floor over to Guy Vizi, representative of Christie's. Thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, it's a Pleasure to be here. Um, thank you to Gazprom Bank for inviting me. Um, it's so tempting to just talk about all of the things I've heard because it raises so many interesting topics. Um, but I thought I'd just say a couple of things. The, the idea of endowments um, is something that is known very well in, in the US. And we do look to the, um, you know, the US example of, of Harvard, let's say. Um, but I, I, I very much see endowments, um, going back to what uh, Dr. Piotrowski was saying, as a security, as a form of, um, of security, so that the running costs, the day-to-day, -day, the, the, the yearly costs of, of these great institutions are kept um, and managed. And I still then see room for you know, governmental funding.
thousands of people come through and spending up to two or three hours looking at you know, a small number of works. Not only does that give us great pleasure, but it's also bringing something new um, to, to Moscow and to Russia. So I, uh, sitting on a, such an august panel as this, um, I would like to um, thank Dr. Piotrowski uh, very openly for giving me the opportunity uh, when I first came to Russia, I was given a, a pass, a uh, free pass to the Hermitage for two months. He probably doesn't even know this, but this was my introduction not only to Russia, but to Russian art. Uh, and what a gift that was, what a, an amazing opportunity. Um, all of you, I'm sure, have been there and spent a long time there. Um, but it really opened my eyes to what a rich cultural legacy and history Russia has. So uh, some of you will know about Christie's, um, others maybe not. Um, we are the world's leading art business. Um, that's a big, bold statement. But um, looking at just the last two days um, of what we've been doing across the world, last night uh, in New York, we had a post-war and contemporary sale, uh, which made a cool, calm 495 million US dollars. Um, we had a sale in Geneva at uh, roughly the same time for jewelry, uh, which raised $100 million, uh, both auction world records for those auctions. Uh, and you may have seen on the news the uh, colorless diamond, which was bought by mm -hmm. Harry Winston, uh, $26.7 million. US dollars. It's a beautiful stone, which I was very fortunate to have in my hand and to have looked at. Probably the only time in my life I will do so, but... Uh, that's why we work in this business, so that we can get so close to these works and we can touch them and be near them and, and, and to spend time with them. But that's not why I'm here today. I'm here today to talk about um, the interactions between um, public institutions and the art market. Now, it's often very easy to sort of see the art market, and especially someone like Christie's, being the kind of the bad boy, you know, being the guy that sort of comes and makes lots of money and um, is all about profits and figures, when actually, um, the, the links between uh, cultural institutions and Christie's are incredibly strong and have been for centuries. Um, if I could just ask for the, uh, the, the point, the, the um, slide thing. That could... Let's see if I can use this. There we go. Okay, so all we have here is we have um, the relationship between the art market and culture. I've tried to break down what the two things actually mean. Um, and we've talked a lot about um, uh, the visual arts, um, big institutions like the Hermitage, the Pushkin, the Tretikov. Um, and then, of course, on the other side, we have the art market. We have auction houses, uh, galleries, dealerships, art fairs, which are this new breed of um, uh, almost like a living organism is the art fair. Uh, all over the world, we have um, these huge um, gatherings of all of the best uh, dealers and galleries from around the world. Um, so looking more specifically about uh, institutions, really with institutions, what we're talking about is, is big public um, institutions such as the Hermitage, such as the Tate in London, uh, the Met in New York. Um, and really the, the relationship between somewhere like Christie's um, it really it comes down to, to what I would say I would call intelligence. Um, the institutions have uh, the academic um, sound knowledge about not only their own collections but also their collections uh, placed within the context of the, of the history of art. Um, and what does Christie's bring to that? Well, we we have the current market knowledge of where things are. So when it comes to uh, loaning for exhibitions. Um, the Tate might approach us and say, we're putting together um, a Malievich exhibition, uh, but we're missing a key piece, and we don't know where it is. And, and at Christie's, if we've sold this work or we've been offered this work, you know, through our global reach, uh, we're able to, you know, to, to work with institutions uh, in finding these, these, these works and, and, and loaning for exhibitions. Um, we're also, uh, on the other, other end of the spectrum, we are, um, a platform to sell. Um, it's, it's sort of relatively unknown that, that museums sell, they do sell. Um, it, you know, deacquisitioning works. It's a bit like uh, any, any great collector. Um, what he liked when he
showing it here is because this work um, was bought by a private collector. Um, and I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to say who it is, but you could probably guess. And uh, this work is now um, in the hands of the Tate um, and is available at the Tate Modern to, to see. Now, that's, it's, it's one very public, very big example of um, a work you know, being shown and, and a sort of donated on loan to, um, to a museum. The next um, slide is a slightly sort of um, sm smaller level in terms of um, monetary value. Um, this work, Sir Edwin Coley Byrne Jones, a great sort of pre Raphaelite painter, um, we brought to Moscow two weeks ago. It's a very big work, uh, very beautiful, very romantic. Um, it's easy to fall in love with these characters, the sort of the vine growing over them. Um, and this work um, has, has recently been in the Tate Britain's exhibition uh, in London, um, and now it's coming to auction. So if we, if we look at the kind of um, the way that we've worked with the institution, we've, we've kind of given access to this work and we have made sure that it um, you know, is, is shown in the Tate Britain and it will now go to sale, but you know, Christie's have also brought the work to Moscow, we're sending it to China. Okay, we're doing it to sell it, but also to, to give fair market opportunity for institutions to buy these works. Um, another case study, uh, the Middle East, uh, is a fantastic example of the fresh new relationship between the art market and institutions, um, or even sort of wider culture, really. Uh, the Middle East obviously diversif diversifying their assets and their uh, investments and looking at tourism. Um, using art as a vehicle to increase tourism um, is a major opportunity in the Middle East. They're building the Guggenheim, the Louvre, um, a national museum. Um, the, the scale and the uh, just the, yeah, just the size of these museums and these, and these collections is quite phenomenal. And obviously the auction houses are working um, to help build these collections um, and also working with you know, the governments in, in, in whatever capacity to, to advise um, where it's necessary. These, these, this is a, an amazing opportunity to see the market and um, kind of contemporary culture moving at the same time and growing together in tandem. Um, so Christie's in Russia. This is um, just a couple of slides to show that um, the relationship between Christie's and Russia, and something that is little known is that our relationship with Russia goes back to Catherine the Great and to the Hermitage. Um, James Christie uh, negotiated the first private sale uh, with uh, Robert Walpole, the first prime minister of the UK. He had a wonderful collection of old master paintings, and uh, his son, uh, after his death, sold them to Catherine the Great, and they all came to the Hermitage. And some of the greatest examples we see on the walls uh, today are from um, Robert Walpole's collection. And here, a, a fantastic example. It's opened last week, and I would invite all of you to go and see it. Um, this is Robert Walpole's, Walpole's collection being returned from the Hermitage on loan to the house that they were once in, in Norfolk, in the UK and are rehung in exactly the same position that they were 200 odd years ago. It's a beautiful example of um, partnership between you know, a, a private home and a public institution. This is the Hermitage having real sort of foresight and, um, uh, you know, and it's a visionary kind of, kind of thing to be doing. Um, and it's, it's, it's doing a, a lot of good for UK-Russian relations as well. Um, I think this is something that we see increasingly, this soft power, this soft diplomacy, using culture as a vehicle to uh, bridge gaps between cultures. Um, so finally, just to conclude, um, we've got to the other side, we've got Leonardo DiCaprio there, who um, he raised a cool, calm 35 million uh, for charity two nights ago in New York. Um, and that was a, a private individual with a cause, wanting to raise money for the environment and using the market as a vehicle to do so. Um, I really believe, just to finish, and I will conclude, that um, patronage within Russia, uh, one of the biggest things I've taken today is this idea of fear. There's fear.
market, they know it very well. Uh, now we are preparing two wonderful exhibitions, and uh, 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 maybe if you want to give this to, to support it, it's in Pushkin Museum. It's a private collection of M M Mikhail Barishnikov that was displayed in New York last year, and also just exhibition of artworks from uh, American private collections, uh, uh, collectors who collect Russian art. And uh, now I'm giving the floor over to super polite Mrs. Sidneva here, and uh, she has been uh, waiting for a long time, but she, likewise to Madame Penteleva, represents the organizers and the sponsors of our event, Gazprom Bank. Gazprom Bank supports culture a lot, which I know from my personal experience, and I'm grateful. Thank you very much. Uh, I do support the best traditions of uh, charity of the bank, just so that I just referred the flow over to my colleague to explain how the things are charity-wise in our bank. I'm very grateful for many references to our bank in the context of support to culture. And, uh, the reference that made by uh, Mr. Guy Vizi about our support for exhibitions is only one side of activity uh, of our bank, which is closely related to uh, other activities. I'm going to cover a little bit more detail, because the interdependence of markets and culture that was elucidated in the previous presentation is uh, quite a, a challenging one and uh, uh, causes a lot of uh, controversial approaches and uh, understandings, because this is a double faced uh, Janus, because on one hand it's a uh, subject of uh, um, spiritual and uh, uh, cultural worship, and on the other hand it's a tangible physical object that has a certain physical properties. So and just material and just a kind of investment features of art attract uh, uh, analysts and uh, mass media and press people. And uh, we remember when the art market was growing fast, so uh, we remember just the record-breaking prices. Van Gogh was for 100 uh, million and some other painting for it. Uh, still greater sum. However, just uh, American analysts, journalists uh, uh, investigated the art market dynamic and uh, they concluded that it is not uh, profitable uh, and uh, beneficial for museums because museums compete uh, with art markets. Uh, so 250 million uh, was a record-breaking sum for Qatar museum uh, who bought uh, a painting by Cezanne. Uh, we all already heard the names like Shukin and Marozov mentioned today. Well, these personas became canonical when speaking about collectors and collections. And uh, very few people, apart from Mr. Piotrowski, remember what they really originally dealt in, because they did become prominent uh, patrons, because uh, they are
uh, uh, the things that spring into mind uh, in such uh, situations. However, it's not necessarily so, because the Metropolitan Museum got a gift from a multi-billionaire larder, uh, they, uh, received a Cubist collection, one uh, billion, uh, 100,000 uh, million dollars worth. So, and uh, the, the, it, it is filled in an important gap in the museum collection, uh, uh, according to the leader of the major museum. So this gap, cultural collection gap, was filled by a private collector. So viewing uh, art as uh, an asset, as I can quote some of the journalists, uh, the desire to combine art and money uh, is wicked because uh, art is non-compatible with money and art uh, for the French journalist art has nothing to do with material tangible values and so on our bank was the first in Russia to develop the art banking as a trend, which is uh, servicing investment in uh, collecting and private collecting in Russia. I was physically attacked by two young artists. Uh, I'm not going to reveal the names because I, I am sure they revisited their position uh, after time. But then they were quite aggressive and thought that to view an art form, an art object as an investment opportunity is a, is a case of vulgarization. And uh, so people like myself and Mr. Visi have to be exterminated physically, in their opinion. However, when we uh, launched this new trend, we targeted at our clients and wanted to offer them the opportunity to diversify their access to protect them from uh, market and uh, price risks. However, it uh, grew and evolved. Uh, uh, this uh, dichotomy, as we said, in, the, in art is a uh, subject, and of course, uh, uh, it's a spiritual and tangible as. is not uh, confirmed 100%. There was a, a, a case in the UK, but the UK has a case law, so it formed the basis for other ongoing verdicts. It was a, a, a case of uh, Ms. Thompson uh, porphyry vases. She bought two porphyry vases dating back to the time of uh, Louis the 15th, and she bought 20 million uh, pounds for that. 
and uh, later on there were doubts arose that uh, it was a later work not to the 17th century but the 19th century uh, so the price would be different she brought the case the case to the court there were eight experts involved as far as I remember they were all reviewed and the judge ruled uh, that the vases were authentic dating back to the 18th century by 70 percent so that was really a funny ruling. However, it was a telling example of the legal approach and opinion uh, about the uh, judge's opinion, who is by no who is no no way is an uh, art historian and he cannot attribute or validate it. And uh, his expert uh, opinion as a lawyer. But going back to collecting traditions and the relationship between the uh, culture and market, it is important to mention, among other culture support tools, uh, uh, corporate collecting, which is not very well known and discussed. The corporate collecting uh, is one of effective uh, ways to support culture because corporate collections, uh, uh, I don't know, it happens uh, so uh, that major ones are held by Deutsche Bank and other major world banks. Uh, they exhibit them in different museums and organize numerous exhibitions. Uh, in Russia, however, uh, there is practically zero support, uh, corporate support, uh, that would be rendered to more than that. So any strategy of building a collection uh, should be based on the idea of uh, building a kind of an integrated collection that will grow in its uh, historical and social kind of significance uh, with time. And uh, not any investor is a collector, uh, but uh, every good collector uh, is an, is a, becomes a good investor, especially if his collection was of great artist, uh, artistic and historical value. So we decided to set up uh, our own corporate collection of modern Russian art. Uh, modern art in Russia is uh, under-supported, uh, almost zero support, basically. So, which is uh, because it's a state of culture that is used to judge about this or that nation. There is an international association of collectors of modern art uh, that uh, involves uh, major banks uh, and others, uh, quite esteemed entities. Uh, there is no Russian institution. I think and hope will be the first one. 
So in conclusion, I would like to say that the bank, uh, with regard to corporate collecting, uh, views it not only as a form of charity, charity or investment, it's a social, uh, socially responsible investment. It's a form of support for culture, and we hope and think it'll bring us a certain dividends. It's going to be a good investment to make. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one more presenter to go. Uh, uh, I think he uh, presents, uh, represents the, the major institution that uh, funds uh, and provides a legal framework, the state. So the Deputy uh, Minister of Culture, the Russian Federation, uh, will be the next speaker, but uh, it, uh, just to pre preclude it, I'd like to say that there is a, a law in there to say that a donator, donor uh, is exempt from tax paying uh, equal in the sum of the donation, and uh, so his donation is appraised not using the price he paid for it, but by the market price. Uh, currently, so as loud as one billion, one hundred million uh, worth uh, kind of purchase uh, for the artwork is the thing is basically um, a great tax privilege for him because he deducted it from his tax basis. Some private investors uh, also began to do the same. They buy more not. Uh, in order to invest, they buy an artwork like Saatchi, for example, and his gallery, London-based gallery, who became famous for that. Uh, they buy art, new artworks, they promote and advertise it, and then they raise the prices dramatically for these artworks. Um, I don't, uh, I'm not suggesting that this is the major reason for the bank here, but it's not bad. It shouldn't be self-conscious uh, if you want to make money, uh, because uh, culture is a growing market, and this is the reality we need to face. So the Gazprom Bank and what they're doing is a brave and big step forward, because our bank and corporate collections focus on uh, uh, classical art. I was witnessing uh, a purchase of an artwork in a gallery that was about 20 years ago or so, and uh, the gallerist uh, uh, told, well, look, it's a good painting, a lot of uh, kind of oil in it. Um, your example uh, was basically an end that we have to pursue. Uh, but it's important to build a kind of a route uh, in order to introduce such a practice and such a legal norm. Speaking about extra budgetary funding, it should be said that the major extra budgetary source of funding is uh, uh, provision of uh, uh, paying services by these cultural institutions. Mariinsky Theatre gets uh, a lot from the state uh, for his current activities, but it makes as much by its own activities. And so this match between the budget funding and the funding that comes from other sources, so the combination is very important. Uh, it is good that we saw that these uh, are multiple sources, and not all of them were mentioned yet. As to the grants, this form uh, of, is, a, is a form of the budget funding that will see further development. And uh, starting 2016, the grant system will change its uh, nature. Uh, we will move on to project-based grants, grant system. Uh, uh, grants will be provided uh, just for those who will achieve the purpose that was voiced by the grant. But the main barrier that was indicated by patrons uh, was that uh, the, the, the resources that they provide get uh, uh, 
uh, are not used fully for the cultural needs. And our patrons uh, uh, said that 50% of the donation would go for taxation purposes. Uh, so just VAT uh, uh, exemption in the cultural services sphere was introduced as an important uh, step. Uh, but in order, uh, but for the patron ship uh, to be able to function in an ideal system, we need to ensure that the money he uh, donates to the cultural institutions does not go for tax paying, thus, thus are brought back to the uh, being brought back to the state, but will be channeled for implementing a specific program. So this is where we should go and aspire to. We have some programs to so called, uh, so to speak, to clear the the field for uh, art patrons, and uh, so we uh, exempt from VAT. Uh, those art forms that would be uh, purchased by the municipal institutions uh, uh, just for extra budgetary uh, monies, because exemption was only applicable to budget money for purchase. Hence, we open the door to more extra budgetary funds to uh, be used to form collections. So. We also open the door for these monies to be uh, uh, used for uh, raising salaries and uh, professional development and so on. For us, it is important to uh, be able to assess how reasonable these new legal norms are, uh, but uh, as to this uh, cultural service VAT exemption, uh, when it was introduced, we saw when just the institution is on tour, uh, then the VAT is still deducted. And the, only 18 percent uh, of population can uh, use uh, kind of you know, stationary theaters and uh, concerts halls and others. So hence we need to extend our touring activity. But the theaters are not interested because if they perform. Uh, on site, they are exempt uh, from VAT, but if they go on tour, they're still paid. <coughs> and these are tours, or are just uh, four tours uh, that the requests for patronship are made. So we approved it with Mr. Shatalov. We fought many battles, but he w we won his support uh, ultimately, and we think it will be a very important breakthrough. Another issue was uh, profit uh, tax. Uh, cultural institutions do pay considerable profit tax. Uh, the state is not interested uh, in that because it is uh, funded through very complicated mechanisms and underfunded many of times. So we uh, developed a, a draft legislation to resolve this, so should it be implemented, uh, it will not uh, fully uh, cancel the profit tax, but uh, it will relieve the cultural institutions uh, uh, just for just for paying uh, that in their core activities. For example, uh, another kind of selection of uh, depreciation. Uh, calculations and basis and other things, rejection of advance payments, uh, uh, filing tax returns during the year. Uh, also, we clarify the procedure for computing of the initial uh, 
cost of the depreciated uh, property, uh, so on. So when we speak of endowments, it's not only uh, that we want to cultivate and, and breed, uh, kind of educate our investor. We want to show that they uh, will t make benefit of the uh, tax breaks and tax privileges. So we need uh, to provide uh, well, an attractive tax regime for these activities. So that will bring down the tax burden uh, in culture and arts. Uh, there are also uh, some partial uh, kind of thing that we have to regulate in some uh, industries so so non so we change this is this, this the uh, approach to uh, intellectual property in uh, audiovisual field uh, and uh, so it was already mentioned uh, and uh, it is important to create a specific mechanism like uh, when the film industry will be d exempt from this cost uh, uh, because uh, a film as a product during one or two years uh, uh, exhaust most of the times uh, it's uh, kind of uh, of its application apart from the major masterpieces of course uh, so uh, advertising costs and culture have to be uh, streamlined uh, so this shouldn't be the burden on the shoulders of the cultural institutions or patrons or donors so uh, so this kind of uh, private mechanisms uh, are not a substitute for the state support. Uh, there are other forms of attracting into culture apart from patronship. Uh, like Mr. Piotrowski said, uh, culture is not using uh, PPP schemes, for example, as is concessions or going public scheme. I think uh, concession option is quite self-evident. It can be well used in culture. And the fact that it is not implemented is only due to the organizational issues. But when I became to work for the Ministry of Culture, I realized how difficult it was to implement it in cultural sphere, though one can easily find the resources to implement it. Uh, what is lacking is the legal environment for concession schemes in the cultural field. So there's a lot of conservatism in cultural field because they really see it as a kind of encroachment or uh, uh, just uh, but for us, it is of great interest, and we will support such uh, trends. In order to fund cultural activities, it's important to have interbudgetary funding when we have some uh, uh, activities funded uh, from the state budget, from the uh, regional or uh, entity or federation budget. There are some barriers, like circus, for example, many entities of federation are prepared to fund their own local circuses, but it's prohibited by the law, so we have to relieve this prohibition. And for example, restoration of uh, uh, religious uh, uh, kind of entities and buildings that just belong to religious uh, institutions themselves, so this is not possible at the moment. So it's not only budgetary mechanisms, but also a, a improved legal environment that we need to ensure. Culture Ministry uh, was very glad to support the patronship law, but only very bold and uh, resolved people can uh, strike uh, the good balance uh, between this one and the charity law. And it is very difficult to identify the good balance between it and uh, the charity system. However, we want to single out this 
uh, uh, mechanism into the separately regulated sphere. If you look at the patronship law, uh, you would not uh, see any privileges that the uh, donor or the patron would be entitled to. It's, for example, when we combat smoking, we also prohibit to pro to mention the names uh, of the major donors and uh, uh, charity givers. But you cannot uh, prohibit references uh, to such uh, names because uh, this uh, support comes from a physical uh, location with a specific address. Uh, we are very happy to get uh, charitable giving from the tobacco companies, which is so that there were no hindrances in charitable support from these types of businesses, the businesses that enjoy negative reputation in the minds of consumers, but still they are ready to uh, give money for culture. Philanthropy creates certain backgrounds, certain contexts within which we can implement a certain uh, scheme for providing tax uh, level, uh, benefits. If we disregard this level, then uh, finding specific tax solutions will be very difficult. Please imagine the most modest suggestion that was m m made by the law on philanthropy. It's 22% of uh, taxable profit. And it's not even a step. It's a minor step. But even this one is not finalized, and we can't say that this norm, that this law will be adopted just. Uh, it is obvious that creating mechanisms for liberating uh, philanthropists from taxation if they uh, give money to cultural institutions regardless of their form of property, is a hot issue, and we must tackle it. Thank you very much, uh, Grigory Petrovich. I think that for the lawyers, if there are any present in this audience, it is absolutely evident that uh, there is a lot of area for activity and improvement for lawyers, for the finance people, and it's an extremely interesting um, area or dimension. So the only word that you wrote down was concession. Concession in the sphere of culture. Please notice that. It's uh, important to know that. So uh, we've spent a little bit longer than we planned. So colleagues, just a couple of questions, if there are any. Please pass the microphone over to the person who has a question. Can you hear me? My question is to Gazprom Bank. And I'm uh, from the newspaper, Blood. I, just for my projects and for other projects more ambitious, those of my colleagues, uh, I uh, sometimes asked money from Sberbank and other major organizations. But then uh, we are celebrating 40th anniversary of Rachmaninov, and nobody gives money for the festival dedicated to this event. Uh, they don't even care writing a letter of refusal. So, um, hence my question. You sponsor, or you just uh, fund a lot of events, uh, football, soccer, and so on. But I'd like to, I'm wondering, what is uh, top priority for you when choosing which project to support? Of course, it is important 
uh, who asks you, Mr. Putin or Medvedev, I understand. But if it is an unknown to your person and he asks for money on a human plane, what it is that you want? What are your criteria? Yes, your question is clear, please. Well, of course, I'd like to give you a detailed answer, but I'm not responsible for the charitable charity policy of my bank. I do interact with the uh, function that is responsible for that, but it's not the issue of whether you get a written answer to your application or not. It's the, uh, well, uh, what is important is probably that you are not ge getting this donation in the long run. But my subjective opinion is that our bank, as well as other major organizations, is that we are only building efficient corporate charity in Russia. Nobody claims to have reached the optimal result. So likewise, everyone else, we are just learning and we are just trying hard to make it maximum efficient. But each organization follows its own criteria in allocating grants and uh, philanthropy money. OK, thank you. I understand. OK, are there any more questions? There are no more questions? Oh, yes, there is. All right, uh, good afternoon. It's Ministry for the Economic Development of Orenburg uh, Area. I'm Deputy Minister. So the Orenburg government is now interested in using the concession and PPP mechanisms, especially in the area of culture. And in practical uh, structure and concession uh, contract, we uh, face the following problem. Private investors uh, gladly uh, enter the agreement, but then um, they become disinterested. They are not interested in using this object uh, uh, to its uh, direct goal. But this is the purpose of the concession. So please tell me, explain how, when using concessional agreements in the sphere of culture, you tackle this problem. If you have any experience of this kind, please share. What is? Uh, what did you mean by the second part of the concession agreement? How can investor uh, use it, uh, the, the, the object that he uh, sponsors later? Well, it used to be our dream, building a circus with the help of concession agreement mechanism. and. Mm, Till now, there are some ways of doing that. Even though we are now starting the restoration of the circus building built in 1930s, in the 30s. But as for um, the use of the circus or any other object, uh, the problem is that the uh, cultural institution management for years has not been uh, uh, just uh, fine-tuned on using all the assets in order to generate profits. They are oriented on creating artworks. And a concession model it does not imply only uh, implementation of a new financial mechanism, but it also implies uh, the uh, state of the art management practices in the country, because it's uh, just uh, choosing through tenders and so on and so forth. And uh, additional use of circus building is uh, an interesting idea for many businesses, but uh, sometimes they can't tackle it. So within the framework of concession model, there are a lot of additional mechanisms uh, that investors can see and must see. And of course, we're trying uh, to help them seeing them. And if no cultural institutions uh, could be turned around towards this kind of activity with a lot of effort only, uh, so it implies a lot of routine work, a lot of in, uh, efforts invested, a lot of uh, yeah, well, uh, sometimes uh, groups of people, personnel numbers, thousands of people, and they must have some mental shift towards that. And uh, of course, uh, we are bound by those new conditions. The number of services rendered is uh, growing uh, within the framework of this model. Mm. And uh, we can claim that in any area of activity, any property or any real estate, 
that culture uh, has is highly valuable and uh, it can uh, find uh, lots of commercial uses but it's not endless because uh, uh, well sometimes uh, when, when collector will be well, well, sometimes we can end up having no research work in museums or monographs if uh, just uh, collectors could rent out their artworks and it would be more beneficial for the museum. So they, here we do not have any kind of infinite or endless opportunities for a robbing culture. There are some firm frames for that. Okay, you can come up to Igor Petrovich now, just corner him and interrogate. This is my good piece of advice to you. Thank you all for the participation and contributions and have a nice day.